Hello everyone and welcome back to the workshop. I think it could be argued that a lathe is one of the most versatile machines one can have access to in a workshop. It can turn parts, cut threads, drill and bore holes, and can be used as a milling machine. And it must be said, they are a lot of fun to use. However, to get the full functionality from your lathe, it does require the purchase of a fair amount of tooling and accessories. Thankfully with lathes, you'll only need to buy a few lathe tools to get started machining, with many of the accessories that are on this list being obtained months or years down the line as you encounter problems that your current tooling just can't solve. So I've put together this list of tools and accessories for the lathe. The first few items are in my opinion essential to get, but as we move down the list, the tools are certainly useful, but don't necessarily need to be purchased when you first buy your lathe. So let's get started. So the most essential tool for a lathe are the cutting tools, and there are certainly a lot to choose from. I have a separate breakdown of the lathe tools, but to really sum it up, I recommend high speed steel lathe tools. You can buy them in pre-ground sets, which you can resharpen with a whetstone, or you can grind them yourself with the aid of a bench grinder. High speed steel is quite affordable and the sharp cutting geometry you can get with high speed steel will allow you to take quite deep cuts on the lathe, and considering that mini lathes don't have that much power, this is a really good type of tool to have. The only real downside to high speed steel is the fact that you do need to regrind your own tools every now and then, and as well as that, the tool edges don't last as long as say, carbide, which is the second type of tool on our list. Carbide is really great because it comes in the form of inserts which you put in holders, which means you don't need to grind your own tools. If the insert breaks, all you have to do is replace the insert. However, the cost to buy carbide tools can be a little bit more expensive than high speed steel and the more blunt cutting edge will force you to take lighter cuts. Either way, a cutting tool is essential for mini lathe use. If you stick to using the standard tool post that comes with the 7x14 lathe, you're going to need to buy 8mm tall tools. It's also essential for you to buy a parting tool. It comes in many different types, though my favourite are very thin parting blades. If you plan on cutting threads using the lathe, I think these carbide thread cutting tool holders work really great, and if you plan on doing boring on the lathe, I think grinding your own high speed steel boring bars is the way to go, because that will ultimately get you the best surface finish. Another great tool that you'll use often on a lathe is a good set of twist drills. Unless you need to machine steel often, I think high speed steel drill bits will suffice. For instance, I regularly tap M5 holes in mild steel, so I use cobalt drills for that operation, but for everything else I use high speed steel. I also think it's a great idea to have a set of imperial drill bits too. You never know when an imperial bit will be the size that you need, especially when you do a lot of tapping. And whilst I don't think you need to spend a huge amount of money on twist drills, I do think a good set of twist drills will certainly make a difference. They will last longer, they will cut better, and they will leave a much better surface finish on the hole. For example, I use a set of Sutton drill bits which are made in Australia, and I have been really happy with how they cut. Alongside a twist drill are these combination spot and center drills which are really vital to have. These are very rigid drills that are intended for you to spot the hole that you intend to drill. If you don't use a spotting drill, what tends to happen is the drill will tend to walk around on the surface before cutting in and it usually cuts in off center. Spotting works using the first few millimeters of the drill. The second larger taper is used for drilling a taper for the live center. If you try and drill this larger taper, you're going to usually end up with a fair amount of chatter. Alternatively, you can also use these spotting drill bits that only spot holes and they work really well. Now in order to use the drills, you will need to invest in a chuck that can fit in the tailstock. 
Mini lathes will usually have a Morse Taper 2 tailstock, so you're going to need to use a Morse Taper 2 chuck. There are two types of chucks that you can use. You can invest in a keyed Jacobs chuck, or you can use a keyless chuck, and each of them have their own pros and cons. I personally prefer to use a keyed chuck because I think I get better feel and control over the amount of force I'm using when tightening the chuck. I can also tighten the chuck with a lot more force if I'm using a keyed chuck. And the only downside to using this type of chuck is the fact that I'll probably lose the key a few times a week. Alongside the chuck, you'll also need to invest in a live center for the tailstock. A live center has a hardened tapered point that is pressed into a ball bearing that allows it to rotate. When you turn long material that has a lot of stick out at the end, it will naturally flex when you try and turn it. And a live center's job is to prevent this by adding a lot more rigidity to the setup. And assuming that the live center is parallel and in line with the center line of the spindle, the work will also be machined concentrically. Another great tool to have at your disposal is some type of layout fluid. Marking out a workpiece to be machined is essential in the workshop, and the most common use of marking fluid on the lathe is marking out lengths to be machined using a caliper of some sort. Most machinists will use some type of blue layout fluid for great contrast, but that can be a little bit difficult to obtain in Australia. So I use Sharpies or alcohol-based markers, and they do the job perfectly. And on the same note, a decent set of calipers is vital for use in the workshop. These are very accurate and multi-purpose measuring devices. They can be used for marking out parts. They can also be used to quickly get a part's outside dimension, its inside dimension, a depth of a hole, and a part's height. In a workshop, I would advise that you avoid using dial calipers because if any dust or small chips gets in the little gear and pinion, that will throw the caliper out. I'd suggest either getting an old school vernier caliper or a digital caliper. Another tool that you need is an oiler for the oil that you will need to lubricate these machines. These lathes require an ISO 68 way oil to be applied on the ways for lubrication and rust prevention, and a lighter slide oil is also used for the tighter cross slides. The people who make my mini lathe also recommend a 630 AA lithium grease for the hand wheel, the bearings, and the lead screw gears. Now in my opinion, these items that I've just listed are the essential items that you will need to get your lathe up and running. The next items on the list are very useful indeed, but they aren't essential and can be picked up when needed or when the tool budget allows for it. And the first accessory that I would buy would be a quick change tool post. These aren't essential for mini lathe use, but once you use one, you'll probably never go back to the old four-way tool post. A quick change tool post allows you to place a tool in a tool holder, set the height once for center line, and in a few seconds, the tool can easily be swapped in and out. Naturally, you will be limited by the number of tool holders that you have, but you can easily buy some more after the fact, or you can easily machine them yourself if you have the correct machinery. Now the less expensive tool holders will usually work using a cam and a pin, whilst the more expensive ones work using a wedge lock. And whilst I recommend using the wedge lock one, the cam lock one actually served me really well for almost two years, and I only ran into issues when I started to machine steel. Another great advantage is that with the stock tool holder, you could only use tools that were 8mm tall, or you could use 6mm tall ones with shims. The quick change tool post allows you to use tools that are up to 12mm tall, which tend to be much more rigid, and have a lot more variety of tool types. Another great accessory to have is another lathe chuck. Mini lathes will come with an 80mm 3-jaw scroll chuck. 
These chucks are really good, but it really limits you to only holding hex or round stock, and they do have a run out of about 40 microns, or eccentricity. This is okay for most use, but an independent forge or chuck is a great method for reducing the run out. A forge or chuck can easily dial out the eccentricity of a part to make it run true. An independent forge or chuck can also cut parts that are square or rectangular, and if needed, can cut eccentric cams. And thankfully replacement chucks only cost around about 50 bucks. Scroll forge or chucks also exist and they are great for holding square stock. Now if you need to set up a chuck, a dial indicator and a magnetic base stand is also vital to helping you dial in the work. Now there are two types of dial indicators, ones with a plunger style and ones with a lever style, and they both have their own pros and cons. The one that I use is a lever style one, I was given it about a year and a half ago and it has worked perfectly. This one here has divisions which are 10 microns each and I think that is enough for use on this mini lathe. If you're intending to cut threads on the lathe using the lead screw, a pitch gauge is really useful because it can help you verify that you have the correct change gears and it's also very useful for helping you find the pitch of unknown threads. And on the same note of threading, many lathes from China will lack the addition of a threading dial, which is essential if you intend to use the lathe for cutting threads. A threading dial attaches to the lead screw, so you can engage the half nut at the correct time, so that the lathe cuts in the same groove each time. Without this, you'll need to reverse the lathe and keep the half nut engaged to avoid multiple threads being cut. It should be also noted that this doesn't apply for all thread pitches. From memory, when I was cutting 1.5 and 0.5mm pitches, I was able to engage the lead screw at any time. Another thread cutting accessory is a tailstock die holder. These can be very easily machined on the lathe, but I bought this one on sale for a great price. It holds all common sizes of button dies and can fit square tap heads too, but I do prefer to use a tap wrench for tapping threads. This tool is very useful and considering that I don't cut threads using the lead screw anymore, this is probably one of the most used accessories that I have. A great tool that you can make in the workshop is a small machinist's hammer. They really come in handy because they can have very soft non-marring heads and they are very useful to make sure that large pieces of stock are flush in the chuck and are very useful for knocking off work from super glue arbors after the glue has been softened by heat or acetone. A machinist hammer is also a really good beginner's project because it helps you understand how the lathe works on a bunch of different materials. This one that I made here was my first project on this lathe and it certainly shows, but I learned so much from this project. A really useful material to get is thin shim stock. Shim stock is great because it can be used to cover the rough edges from the chuck jaws, which is really good when you don't want to mar soft materials that you've already finished machining. If you intend to turn steel or do a fair amount of tapping or thread cutting, I think it's a really good idea to have some sort of cutting fluid. Turning steel produces a lot of heat and cutting fluid will increase the performance of the tool and also increase the tool life. Cutting fluid also helps when you're cutting threads because it helps lubricate the tap and die and you end up getting much cleaner threads. And whilst there are some really great cutting oils on the market, in the past I've gotten away with using thin 3-in-1 oil or paraffin oil, but for turning or drilling steel, I think a proper cutting oil is the way to go. Cutting oil can also be used on a knurling tool, which is a tool that can be pretty useful. A knurling tool is used to give those textured knurled patterns on thumb screws or handles to allow you to have a better grip and I went quite a long time before actually needing one. And although they aren't too expensive, with a mill and the correct material, you can easily make a knurling tool yourself. 
If you intend to do a lot of knurling on the lathe, I think the clamp style ones are the best ones to get as they reduce the cutting forces on the spindle bearings, but for the occasional use, then the cheaper push style ones work just fine. Now if you intend to do a lot of work using large diameter stock, I think spring dividers are really great for marking out diameters on the parts face. However, in my workshop, they really get any use. Another tool that you could get are micrometers. Micrometers are also another set of measuring tools, but they are much higher precision tools than calipers. The anvil and spindle are used to measure a part, and it's tightened using a ratchet, and the scale is used to measure the distance in conjunction with another scale. These are very accurate, but in my opinion, don't have too much use on a smaller import lathe, due to the limit of precision that we can really ask from them. However, if you do need to measure precisely, these are the tools to get, but they can be pretty expensive. And finally, if you need to machine the end of a large round part, and you're unable to use a live center, you may need to invest in a steady rest. A steady rest helps you reduce the flex in heavy materials with a lot of stick out and it allows you to machine the end when there is no center. In my experience, I've never really needed one on the big lathe and whilst my Sherline came with one, I've only used it maybe three or four times. For some people, they are certainly necessary, but on a mini lathe, they do have their uses, but those uses aren't exactly common. I really hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something from it. And with that, see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.